Welcome to the One Minute Preceptor Podcast, your resource for clinical rotation advice and tips to prepare for your externships in healthcare. Learn how to earn letters of recommendation, prepare for your clerkship, and excel at patient care from preceptors with years of practice. We interview physician educators in every specialty and clinical setting to discuss how to prepare for your rotation and improve your clinical experience. Here's your host and MedEd entrepreneur, Chase DeMarco. Today we have Dr. Brian Dorick, who is a private practice gastroenterologist in South Florida. His practice specializes in colon cancer screening, heartburn, GERD, constipation, IBS, and hepatitis. He actively produces Lunch with Dr. Dorick, educational videos for the LinkedIn community, and has 11 years of clinical education experience. Brian, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast and your listening audience. Yeah, thank you. I've uh, been watching your videos on LinkedIn for the past little bit now and thought they were pretty interesting and wanted to reach out. So I'm glad we could schedule a meeting. Uh, my pleasure. I'm glad we were able to uh, coordinate a time. i uh, like to start with a quick question, and that is, what is the funniest or the scariest thing that you've ever seen in the hospital setting? Definitely a lot of things. I think one of the most memorable experiences for me was literally around the time of, it was New Year's Eve. I was in New York City as an intern. So I was midway through my first year. And I remember we were in a hospital on the Upper West Side, but still close enough to Times Square, in Columbus Circle, if you know Manhattan. And there was a guy in an isolation room. We were dealing with worrying about TB or tuberculosis. So he was in a respiratory isolation room. And he became unresponsive and I was on night call and I got called into the room and still learning what to do. And the simplest thing to do when someone is not responsive is one, check a pulse and make sure they have a pulse, but also check their sugar and see what their sugar is because if it's low, as it was in this case, someone could easily pass out. And the simplest thing to do at that point is to give some IV sugar or dextrose. So at this point, we came to the realization the patient had too much insulin, he was a homeless guy from New York City and wasn't well-controlled diabetic, wasn't eating, and sugar had plummeted, and thus he passed out, was unresponsive. And I was called, not knowing what to do. I was guided by the nurse. And as we gave him the sugar, you can hear the countdown in Times Square of the ball coming down at five, four, three, two, one. And as you heard the roar of Times Square, this guy popped out of bed. <laughs> And just jumped out at us. So that was one of, like, like a, a memorable experience. Uh, you know, it was definitely being an intern, especially in New York City, which is for me a goal was to be in a big urban center where it's kind of like uh, coal. When you put coal under a lot of pressure, it becomes a diamond. And that's kind of the experience I had in the, you know, the urban setting of training. <laughs> that guy had really good timing. Yeah, it was kind of uh, interesting. It was something I remember. So in your role as a private practice gastroenterologist, it's a pretty niche uh, specialty that a lot of students probably don't get to either rotate in at all or maybe just for a week or two. Like, what are some unique aspects of the specialty for a student potentially rotating through? I think one of the beauties of gastroenterology, you know, as a clinical specialty, we focus on GI and liver diseases. So gastroenterologists are also essentially hepatologists. We do GI and liver disease. I think the beauty of our practice, there's a symmetry to it. You're seeing patients and then you're doing procedures. So it's kind of like a mixed day. You're not having, you're not just seeing patients all day in your office. You're actually seeing patients, scheduling procedures, where you're doing procedures and seeing patients and follow up. So there's kind of a symmetry in the sense you have to see people and do procedures and you have them in follow up. So there's a balance to it. So you have a kind of a broad experience. You get a kind of a varied experience of your day or of your week spending time with a gastroenterologist versus just sitting and doing one thing day in, day out. So there's a, there's a unique uh, component to it. I think it's the fact that it's procedure-based, it remains very clinically oriented and actually very relatable because all of us have had stomach pain. All of us has had, have had diarrhea. Some of us have had constipation. Some have had heartburn. People know what bloating is and gas and how debilitating some of these symptoms can be in your own personal life or socially for that matter, you know, if they're chronic. So it's something that even if you're sitting listening to a patient as a student, you're not going to understand what heart failure is clinically or 
COPD per se, but you're going to know what diarrhea is and crampy abdominal pain. So I think that it's uh, relatable to students on that level. Yeah, we all have a little intuitive knowledge and experience <laughs> yeah. with GI. So and, more than others, but yes, it's true. <laughs> and it, it seems kind of like, well, surgery is still a core rotation. And sometimes you get stuck in, or not stuck in, but placed in a surgical rotation where you have outpatient, pre-op, post-op, but then you also go into the hospital for procedures for surgeries. It sounds like you might have some of that as well with being private practice and the procedures that you have the option to do that aren't really common in other specialties or in general internal medicine. True. When we're doing screening colonoscopies per se, or upper endoscopies, the turnover is much quicker. There's no scrubbing in, there's no gowning up and whole you know, pre-op procedure. You're not standing there in an operating theater kind of at the bottom of the totem pole or, you know, when they say we're, what rolls down the hill, you know, it's usually the student in the theater. So it's, you know, for procedures, it's much higher volume, quicker turnover. A colonoscopy from start to finish can be a 15, 20 minute procedure total time. You end up doing 10, 12 patients before lunch between upper endoscopies, colonoscopies, sigmoidoscopies, sometimes with balloon dilations of the esophagus. So it's a much more varied kind of a, you can see a lot more in a less, I would say less controlled, but definitely less sterile environment is a good way to put it. So uh, <laughs> in this kind of setting, is it more frequent that you would see MD and DO students or mostly fellowship? Are there nurse practitioners and PAs that participate? Or how is the arrangement of students? I mean, I think, you know, thinking back to my fellowship, I did my GI training at University of Miami at Jackson Memorial. And we had DOs and MDs in our fellowship program. One of them actually just spoke to you the other day. So there's a varied thread. I know that where I'm in practice now in South Florida, there's a big DO school up the street, Nova Southeastern. So my hospital actually has DO students rotating through now in kind of a community teaching hospital. So I think that the DO exposure is dependent on where you are. I know if you're near, I think Nikon in New York is a big DO school. It depends where you are. If you're in a, in a proximity geographically to a school is a big DO center, you're going to have those students. With doctors, same thing. There's not much discrepancy, at least in the communities I've been in, in New York or in Miami, South Florida, as there may be in middle America or other parts of the country because this exposure is much greater. Yes. I've noticed most places I've been, and I did rotations in several different states that MDs and DOs were pretty even keel on that aspect. The one thing that seems to change, and this is probably more by specialty than by geographic location, is where you see nurse practitioners and PA students. Sometimes they're even with the MD and DO students in competing for certain rotations, and sometimes you just never see them. So that's a little more sparse. Yeah, I don't, I don't recall having had nurse practitioners or PA students on medical rotations with me. I know we have students in our endoscopy center that are medical assistants, LPNs, RNs. Some PAs have come through. Nurse practitioners are a different breed. They're usually nurses who have gone back to advanced level of training. So those programs are structured, they're expensive, and they have their own rotations established typically. They're not competing with you know medical students, from what I understand. It's possible they're varied or added on. Definitely in multi-specialty or multi-level treatment teams, there's roles for nurse practitioners, PAs, nutritionists, dietitians. I'm talking about like a transplant team or an intensive care unit team in a high volume, you know, level one trauma center, where you have a multidisciplinary team involved, social workers nutritionists, dietitians, wherever specialties are needed. But as far as the clinical rotations from my exposure in New York City and down here in Miami, it was always very separate. Got it. Okay. And then within your specialty, uh, subspecialty even, what do you think are some quality traits that a preceptor should have if they're deciding to bring on students or how can they benefit the students and make sure it's a safe learning environment? I think the safe learning environment is clear the safe issue at first. I'm very big on eye, eye protection and goggles because it's very easy to forget that we're dealing with bodily fluids, you know, even from doing colonoscopies. 
And even though we're using quantoscopes that have valves and buttons, you know, things fly out. You know, there's back pressure, there's leakage, things happen. And you can get hepatitis C if you're getting feces in your eye, to keep it real. Oh, jeez. So it's not a case that happens often, but I'm very cognizant of the fact that if I'm bringing a student into my room or I have a nurse in my room or an anesthesiologist in my room or anyone in my room, I'm always going to mention at least once, please wear a protective eye gown or eye recovery or face mask or goggles. To wear gloves, obviously, and use precautions. I am not going to force another doctor or an anesthesiologist to do it, but I'm definitely going to force a student under my care to do it. So that's a safety issue. Universal precautions across the board. Always wear protective eye you know, gear or protective eyewear. When you're in a procedure-based room that involves any type of instrumentation, because there are bodily fluids and there could be blood exposure or GI, there could be fecal matter if you're doing colonoscopy. Not that it happens, not, stuff's not flying all over the room, believe me, but you're talking about safety. As far as the qualities of the preceptor, I think the qualities that are most relevant is one, a patience for learning, a patience for curiosity. And two, a kind of reflection on that you were there once, a reflection that there's a, everyone starts somewhere. And so keeping things too complicated, too quick, or too minute and too detail-oriented, I'm speaking only from experience in my own life, sometimes too much details, you miss the big picture. You know, you don't see the forest through the trees. So it's broader strokes, I think, matter more. And I think broader strokes should be the focus, especially when you're teaching. The details come. And I only say this because when you're a student, you're gunning for the grade. You're gunning to stand out in the rotation, to look the best, to be, you know, the golden student in the eyes of the preceptor or whoever's rotating in charge of your rotation for that matter. And I think that sometimes we're studying so much detail and we're looking to impress and looking to get the minute detail of what's von Hippolandu syndrome or some little, you know, anomaly disease state to, to shine. You're missing the concepts of understanding just the basics of cardiac output, the basics of pulmonary function, the basics of GI motility, the basics of nutrition, the basics of how things work and why they work and why the kidneys are moving sodium one way and potassium another way. So it's not so much the details that matter as much as focusing on understanding the concepts. Everything else will fall into place if you understand it. We do have to remember so much minutia for board exams. It's hard sometimes to remember that, coming back to the basics. I feel like GI is probably one of those uh, specialties that you're less likely to forget about the eye protection in general. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, don't forget, I've taken the boards. I took my GI boards. And I took my recertified my GI boards a few years ago. So I know what you're talking about with details. It's, it's brutal. But I also remember studying details upon details upon details for hours upon hours when I probably should have gone for much bigger, broader stroke understanding and gone to the beach a little bit more. But that's you know, <laughs> retrospect. <laughs> retrospect. <laughs> when you're in it, you're when you're in it, you're always gunning for the, you know, for the hundred and ten percent, which is the way it should be. But reflection's easier as an afterthought. And wouldn't we all like to go to the beach more? <laughs> yeah. Do you use anything similar to the one-minute preceptor model in your type of clinical setting? In terms of, give me an example of how you would define the one-minute preceptor model in the clinical setting. It would be better if you example for me. So the one-minute preceptor model is the five-step process that it's a generalizable process used for preceptors uh, to, to quickly, within a minute, teach a student a certain topic. So the five steps are one, to get a commitment from the student, such as what diagnosis they think it is or what treatment they think they should use. The second would be probing for supporting evidence. So asking them why they believe that that's the correct uh, line of treatment or diagnosis. Third and fourth have to do with reinforcing what they did right and then what they did wrong. And then the fifth part is kind of a general principle or a clinical pearl. Yeah, I think it's always kind of the best model. And kind of when I was there, we wouldn't use the word, you know, one minute preceptor model is more of see one, do one, teach one. And along those lines, it was kind of the same thing, you know, by seeing from example and doing it yourself and then being corrected on what was right or wrong. 
and then kind of summarize and kind of reflecting and then sending them on their way to do it and teach someone else. So it's, again, I think it's a very broad and basic model that would be applicable not just to preceptoring a medicine, but to teaching children or teaching anyone anything. I think it's sometimes better to teach through nudging than through pushing, if that makes sense, or to teach through kind of guiding versus pulling or pushing someone down a certain direction. You're kind of giving someone space to see where they are, guide them and nudge them a little bit in the right direction, probe and see why they're thinking that way, make the corrections and tweaks as needed versus shoving the whole thing down their throat. So I think it's a much healthier way to learn. Sometimes it's easier to have your experiences in those processes will be a lot more meaningful and a lot more impactful if you're making an assumption or a directional decision and 80 percent of it or say 60 percent of it's right you're tweaked on 20 percent you're at 80 you talk further you're now at 100 versus someone you're you started zero someone gives you 100 percent and then they walk away you're not going to retain that 100 percent you're going to retain the 20 percent with a lot greater you know impact and long-term value it really sounds like you're emphasizing really a mentorship type of teaching model. And I, I kind of want to go back to the very first episode I recorded for this, which depending on when this episode airs could be a, a while from the first one. And that was something that was really emphasized as mentorship over just kicking the, the student into the room, not watching them while they do the patient interaction, having them come back out and explain it to you. And then you don't know what's actually going on in the room. You don't know what might be being left out. And uh, it isn't quite as impactful or as strong of a learning experience for the student. Well, don't forget, I mean, mentorship, these are colleagues. You know, these are, we're teaching colleagues. We're not teaching students in that sense. You know, I, you need to look at doctors. These are young doctors. These will be the future. They will drive the changing algorithm, the changing way medicine is practiced. Some may be the thought leaders in the certain fields. Some may not. Be involved in medicine at all you know everyone you don't know who you're dealing with but the point is this is your colleagues this is the next generation these are the people that are going to be taking care of you in a sense so i don't think it's a much a it's not a vocational school where you're teaching someone a trade or a craft and say i'm on the way to open the uh, the ac you know tech business or become a auto mechanic this is a interactive educational dialogue among colleagues different levels at this point, but among colleagues. I like the way you phrase that. Very nice. Yeah. You like the way I phrase it because you, you're closer to being a student than I am. <laughs> you're closer to the bottom of the hill where it rolls down. But yes, it, it is a much healthier way to look at it. If we approach you know, young doctors as colleagues versus students in that sense. Agreed. I'd like to see more of that. Now, yeah. <laughs> not uh, yeah. not in my clinical rotations anymore for some time, but it would have been nicer to have experienced more of that during my clinical experience. <laughs> so if a student wanted to do a rotation with you or someone else in this specialty, are there any particular recommendations you would say as far as how to prepare for or what you would expect from them when they start off? I think one, having a genuine interest in what the specialty is. Two, have a genuine interest to sit and watch procedures. I think three is when I was a student and a question came up, if I didn't know the answer, I didn't say, I don't know. I said, I will tell you tomorrow. It became that type of a learning thing. It became very clearly on day one of the rotation that if you know the answer, you'd be presenting on it tomorrow for a few minutes to the group. So I think taking the initiative and learning. And if you're watching colonoscopy on your first day and you're seeing diverticulosis for the first time, well, you read about diverticulosis and diverticulitis at night. If you're seeing someone with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis as a new thing for you, read about inflammatory bowel disease. Come back with educated questions the next time. Not to become a professor or not to be an expert of the field, but to use that as your building blocks. Every day, come home with a go home with a short list of topics you're going to read about that night. And now, with up to date or you know resources like that, it's very easy to just even catch the summary recommendation sections of an up to date section to get a sense, get some broad sense ideas. Are there any 
particular resources that you would recommend before coming to this, such as a, a book that a student might want to look into or certain test questions that they could find? Or is it really more of a hands-on learning experience based on the level of knowledge they currently have? I think that there's so much information now on the internet. With YouTube, it's beyond remotely what I had when I was a student. I think the internet was just starting. When I was in medical school, there was a few computers and people were on AOL and things are dial up. I mean, not to age me, I'm not, I'm not even 50 yet. I'm in my late forties, but point is things are just coming about, you know, the internet error, Yahoo and things like that were just coming about when I was a intern in New York city in 98 to 2002. So around 1999, you know, I was in New York city when the high tech stocks were becoming big and this is, you know, this is a different time things have dramatically changed in some ways. So I think that now one of the most important things to do, if you're watching colonoscopy is to watch a video on what's actually going on. There's some great videos that will show you what happens with the scope. What's the concept inside the body? How are loops formed? How do you reduce the loops? What are you looking for? You can watch procedures now. You can go in as a student on a GI rotation, having watched hours upon hours of colonoscopies on YouTube. So I think it's a very different time, a very different era than it was back then. You can watch simulation videos. You can even, I practiced colonoscopies on simulators. I was a part of a study at University of Miami where there was model simulators where we were doing colonoscopies on these artificial intelligence dummies, basically like CPR dummies where your patients are even computers yelling, ouch, 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 if you were putting too much pressure on the wall. So I, I think the technology has evolved from there. The concept is there's there's a lot of learning out there to be done. You got to choose it. I'm sure there's more things on the phone, on the iPad, on all the interfaces, on all the platforms. If anyone that listens to this knows of any good simulators, I'd love to know that myself and, and play around with them, add them to the show notes. Uh, <laughs> sounds like a lot of fun. The only thing I was thinking of during your description there is uh, I did an interview for the Inside the Boards podcast not too long ago with Jomi, the Journal of Medical Insights, and they have a lot of surgical procedure videos on there uh, and like a very organized list that could be a ne neat resource for uh, students to check out. Yeah, the, the list, the amount of information is overwhelming. You got to find the ones that work for you and filter everything else out, I think. Very true. Do you notice in your specialty, are there special demographics uh, that you serve, um, maybe more related to GI and uh, hepatic failure and, and those types of conditions? Well, I'd say according to GI, the main demographic we serve is say colon cancer screening. So the 50 year old average risk person needs a colonoscopy for screening. Now the American Cancer Society is recommending age 45. We've been screening age 45 for African-Americans for average risk for a while. So that's like your bread and butter of what GI does. Heartburn and reflux, that's really not age dependent. We see that at all ages. Liver failure and cirrhosis. Yeah, I see the baby boomers who had been exposed to IV drugs in the 70s who got hep C. You know, more so in the VA, when I rotated in the VA hospital, the veterans in the Vietnam, et cetera, had hep C and develop cirrhosis, but that whole game has changed too with the new therapies that are now available. We now have very effective drugs that are oral and that can be taken for eight weeks or 12 weeks and get a 98% or so cure rate for hepatitis C versus before we were using interferon and all these IV drugs. So things have really changed in that regard. And I think that it's hard to generalize patients, but we definitely have a broad range. I don't deal with pediatrics, that's another whole uh, conversation. But IBS, you could generalize and say, yes, a middle-aged woman with bloating and constipation, but many, many people come to us with bloating and constipation, many genders, many sexual orientations, many skin colors, many races, many religions. So it all comes back to diet in a lot of people. So those choices are kind of universal. <laughs> A so, uh, small tangent then, what would you recommend as a good resource for students or patients for maybe having a better diet? I think, you know, it's again overwhelming the amount of information out there and the amount of resources people have at their fingertips. 
social media obviously is great to a point. You got to be careful who you listen to. I don't know if there's one resource I say is the go-to for diet. You got to find what works for you. For me, it's not extremes. It's not fads. It's not quick fixes. It's sustainable, balanced, healthy weight loss. Um, I like plant-based mostly. I do eat some fish. I do eat some eggs. So it's not a one source, but pick up any basic book on nutrition or just go to the, the web now. I mean, you can just look at any website. We'll give you plenty of information on the basics of eating. But when you take all that information there, then apply it to your own life. And I would say balanced, healthy portion control, not avoiding carbs, not avoiding fats, not ketosis, not one meal a day, not starvation, not fasting. We're looking to have balanced, healthy eating across the day. Um, obviously, choosing the right foods, finding a balance. It's okay to have some wine. It's okay to have some sweets. But, you know, when the staple meal is, you know, two slices of pizza and a Coke for lunch, I'd say rethink it. But again, that's my own take. It's my own experience having gone through some things. But that couples with exercise and health, other healthy choices. Because eating well all day is fine. But if you're drinking a bottle of wine at night, maybe not such a good idea. You know, you're loading up with carbohydrates and sugars there. If you're eating well but not exercising or moving your body because you're sitting on the bed binging Netflix day in, day out, probably not a good idea either. But it's, it's a kind of a multi, multi-faceted approach to health and nutrition. Got it. Yeah, it's very difficult to find reliable information. I try to stick to a mostly plant-based diet as well, but I do Smart. need to get my butt off the couch a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For that, I would say just look at short interval exercises. I do a lot of, I don't go to the gym right now these days. I actually work out at home on outside. I do Freeletics. It's an app, German-based, doing 20-minute workouts three times a week. And it's a great, uh, I'm enjoying it a lot. I did a, a workout tonight before we got on this podcast. I think my workout was probably about 21 minutes, but that was it. But I definitely moved. I got broke a good sweat, got my heart rate up. And that was it for today. You know, I'll catch a run one time during the week, do three times of these body weight workouts. I have some dumbbells, so I'll do some weights sometimes. It's a function of time. I've gone to CrossFit gyms. I've gone to gyms. I've done many, many things over the years, but you got to vary it up. You got to do what works, but definitely sitting on the couch, not the move. <laughs> yeah, agreed. For uh, students that might be interested in a letter of recommendation from you, are there any tips or advice you would suggest for them either before even starting? Do they, should they ask for it, prepare you for it, or is it something they build over time? I think, you know, do your best, show effort, show commitment, show that you're reading, show that you're taking the initiative, and hope that someone writes an amazing letter. Because I've had, I had one rotation in Columbia, I was in New York City, and I was a I was a resident. I was applying for my fellowship. I ended up doing this rotation at Columbia, up from Manhattan. Ended up being with this guy, Pete Stevens. The guy was like a cowboy, like one of the top billiard endoscopists, like really cutting edge stuff. And rotated with him, ended up on his rotation just by, ro- by luck. Had a good month, and I asked him to write a letter. And he wrote this amazing letter that I just couldn't even imagine. And that letter went out within three days. I was getting phone calls from Harvard, from Yale, from Cornell, because this guy's name meant so much. And I wasn't getting offered spots at those places because they took care of their own. But it was flattering to go to interview for fellowship at Cornell and, you know, up in Beth Israel and Brigham and Yale and et cetera. It was just like, wow, holy shit. Yeah, sorry. It was like, but it was because this guy's letter just opened doors up. So you don't know who you're going to rotate with. You don't know the power of their letter. You don't know what connections they have. You don't know what channels it's going to lead to. You don't know who's going to go to the bat for you. So just do your best. Be prepared. Take initiative. Study. Don't over try, but really be present and be participating there in the rotation. Yeah, it's something I hear from a lot of preceptors is sometimes you have that student that is too much of an overachiever and they sort of cross some boundaries. They rub some people the wrong way. So you don't want to be that person. Oh, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, definitely. But again, you're in a competitive environment. You're in a competitive field and we're all type A to some degree to go to medical school. We all have that drive within us, that push. 
So it comes out sometimes more than others. So it's going to find that balance. For more of a personal ending here, I have two questions, and you can choose either one or both if you'd like. And the first one is, is there anything that you would have done differently in your education or career? I would have understood things more, understood concepts more, understood broad ideas more versus looking at the details. This is what I mentioned before. I wish I understood things in better, deeper, broader understanding versus trying to get through the material and understand every little minute detail. I wish I understood broader concepts better. That was, you know, again, multi-system, pulmonary, renal, things, cardiac, things like that. In retrospect. The second one is, what is one dream that you would like to see in medicine in your lifetime? I think there's one dream that I think would be beneficial to all. It's really having an integrative system where there's communication seamlessly among many levels, among systems, among hospitals, among doctors, among specialists, among primaries, and among patients. Right now, the system is fractured. Every system has their own computerized EMR. Every office has their own EMR. We're faxing papers because that's the only way to do it securely still. Some of it's electronic, some of it's not. One doctor doesn't speak to the other doctor. EMR notes are monstrosities of information. We're not even seeing the facts. The VA system is not plugged into my healthcare system. My healthcare system is not plugged into the Cleveland Clinic, which is 10 minutes away. So it's like you have all these fractured systems. So one unified, free-flowing system, and it would be something aligned with the mindset of Steve Jobs, simplicity, clean, organized, aesthetically appeasing, that flows, not what we have, which is an overabundance of useless information to deal with the asininity of the this, of this system in terms of billing, in terms of medical legal protection, in terms of big farm in terms of billing and cost and money to be made and the greed that's behind it. So that's the ideal scenario. One simple iPhone <laughs> you know, that just works you know, for everyone. That would be <laughs> not, quite not, not going to happen. But it's a good thought. <laughs> Well, hopefully, at least when it comes to educational material, these podcasts and others that are doing similar activities seem to be reaching a wide and diverse crowd all across the nation, all across the world. So at least education might make the change initially at the hospital systems that that could take a little while longer. Then I, I think so. It's, uh, it's not going to happen, but it's a good thought. you know. Do you have any parting thoughts for students? I think the one thing to realize medicine is not the profession it was, at least that I saw growing up in the 70s or early 80s. And that's fine because you never saw medicine at that time. The medicine I saw was already changing from time to medicines in the 50s and 60s. So it's a constantly evolving dynamic profession. The truth of it is, it takes a lot more effort to make good money in medicine as we did, you know, fiscally decades ago. But the truth of the matter is, in the end, it's still a very, very honorable profession. You're still doing good. You're helping people. And if you love what you do, that's the most important thing in getting up for your day. You're not in a position where you're any less rewarded or less, I guess, acknowledged or less secure than someone who goes into the for-profit sector and has a job. Because what happens when you turn 55 and you're working for a company? Well, you're going to be very, very unstable in your job and your career when young kids are coming out of college or out of grad school and wherever they are, gunning for your job, willing to do it for less, more motivated, more driven, and more on top of the changing times, wherever those may be in the future. So for me, I think in the end of the day, although I'm exposed to excessive wealth here in Miami and South Florida, and you see all these people and you think it's, Oh, what amazing careers and jobs they have. You don't know the truth behind it, for one. Two, I love what I do. Three, it's an honorable, great profession where I can make a great living and support my family. And four, really, really in the end, helping people. And there's nothing more rewarding than that. And it's your responsibility to advocate for your patients and step up to them and take them through what could be a very challenging time or routine time and not to lose sight of what it's like to be on their end. And waiting to see you in the waiting room for an hour, waiting to get an appointment for two, three weeks to see you, 
not feeling well, scared, or not even knowing what's happening. So I'll leave you on that, and I'll leave you with one parting thought. I it was shared with me from an elderly, elderly, I say it's probably in the 60s, semi-retired gastroenterologist when I was taking a board review course the first time. He said, I'm only as good as my last note. And it sticks with me. And to this day, it's tiring and I'm compulsive and I'm very detail oriented, but I still go by, I'm only as good as my last note. So if you're going to do something and you're going to have an encounter with a patient and you're going to document something, make it the best you can do. So it's Dr. Dorek. I'm going to tell you, as I tell people on my LinkedIn uh, post, lunch with Dr. Dorek, you know, eat smart, eat healthy. And I'll tell the medical students, and those rotating study hard enjoy what you're doing enjoy the process enjoy the trip and obviously i'm available to be contacted through you or through social media with any questions or if anyone wants to spend time or watch procedures in south florida you're always welcome to join me awesome that is a great ending <laughs> thank you so much dr brian doric we'll add your contact information in the show notes as well so students and listeners can reach out to you my pleasure. Anyway, thanks for having me on and uh, keep doing what you're doing and all good stuff. We'll be in touch. 